right, class. Uh, we have some momentum now, and uh, we have a better idea of the direction that we're going. And I am moving uh, very swiftly through creating content for you. And I'm, I'm starting to feel very confident in the rest of the semester. So it just kind of took me a week to get my bearings and find my footing and get the right information. And I think we've, I think we've finally arrived. So having said that, um, we are now going to move into our second official lecture. Um, following the lecture we had the other day talking about why we conduct research in the first place and uh, trying to combat that, uh, that culture of misinformation that we are uh, certainly, we have our hands full with that battle. Uh, so today what we're going to do is an overview of the classifications of research. Now by no means do you have to understand all of these thoroughly because these are just some of the classifications of research that we are going to explore uh, throughout the semester. So we're just going to kind of give you an overview or a basic taste of each one of these with very, very short descriptions because there's no reason to go into a deep dive uh, until we actually get to that type of research. So I don't want you to th really think uh, or worry about um, remembering all these or memorizing them. Just basically have uh, the, the basic gist of it. So we have a couple of very simple classifications of research. Um, and the, the big ones that we're going to focus on today are going to be by originality. So you can see that we have primary and secondary uh, research. Um, for the sake of this class, we are going to be conducting secondary research because we're going to be writing a lit review, but we're going to be using primary sources. Um, and primary sources means original research that was conducted by, conducted by a lab. Um, and they had gone through the hypotheses. They had gone through collecting data. They had gone through analyzing that data. Uh, they had um, subjects that they had brought into the study. And at the end of that study, they had made a statement uh, in the discussion about what they found and what that means for physiology. Um, since we don't have a lab, we won't be conducting that. But we will be using primary research uh, within our readings and within our lit circles and within our presentations where we do the exams to tell a story for our secondary research, which you are going to be conducting in this class with the lit review. So we'll use primary sources and we will make a secondary um publication about what we found. Now, we also have two different types of designs that are commonly used in research. One is quantitative, and it is underlined because that is what we will 99.9% .9 of the time see in the realm of nutrition and in the realm of exercise physiology and in the realm of pathophysiology and in the realm of uh, biomedical sciences. We use quantitative research. Um, we do not use a lot of qualitative research. Uh, you will see more qualitative in um, research such as sociology or psychiatry or um, you know uh, those types of those types of studies. They don't. They use more of a narrative than they use hard evidence uh, that is collected and analyzed with statistics. So uh, generally, we in our in our worlds we do we conduct primary research, and we use quantitative over qualitative. Um, designs. And then we also have different levels. So we have originality, we have design types, and we have levels. You have your basic sciences and you have your applied science. And this one is underlined as well because in our neck of the woods with nutrition and exercise and physiology and biomedical sciences, uh, we generally tend to use more of the applied sciences than basic sciences, okay? Um, so again, we will focus, we're not gonna focus on all of these in class, but I'm just kind of showing you the contrast to what is out there. Um, so we are gonna look at primary research to conduct secondary research that we will do through our lit studies. We are more than likely 100% uh, of the time for the sake of this course, going to use quantitative data and we are generally going to use applied sciences versus basic sciences. So let's do a little bit of an analogy for some of these because I like to provide pictures for my students so they can say, oh, I, he, he uses this analogy and that makes a lot of sense. So if we look at primary versus secondary research, primary research would be uh, similar to this image here. You are going to bake some bread or let's say you're going to make pita bread or let's say you're going to make a cake. Uh, this would primary research would be you um, getting the recipe, finding the materials, uh, measuring everything, 
uh, getting everything put together and then mixing it and then baking it and then you have your product. So you have conducted all of the work from point A to point Z and then you come up with this product. Secondary resource or I'm sorry, secondary um, research would be like you ordering meal prep. It's still food, right? We have food here, we have food here, but someone else has done it. So we're, we're taking information from other people, right? In this case, other people have made the food and we are just digesting it. Um, so that would be an example of primary versus secondary. And we are going to take all the primary research and we are going to write a secondary paper. Um, here are a bit more examples. I just like to beat a dead horse, especially when we are doing things virtually. It's just harder to make sure that you get them. Uh, you understand what I'm saying. Um, so if we look up here, you can see we have primary and secondary. Primary research is specific data from a single source. Generally, that source is a lab. Um, results and observations in their original context, they haven't been changed whatsoever. It's coming from the author's mouths. This is what we found. This is what we did. Here is our results. At the end of it, when you get to the findings, or the, the, you get to the discussion, they say, here is what we found that is now contributing to the uh, pages of science and uh, more details about a few things. And what, what does that mean? Well, that means that usually in the discussion, they say, okay, here's where we're going next. Here's some other things that we speculate is occurring versus secondary research where these are overviews of multiple sources. Again, this would be an example of a lit review or of a meta-analysis or of a narrative. And if you don't know what that is, I put them here because uh, we probably won't be reading many of these. We're gonna be reading more of these. But uh, when we start a lit review, when we start to create and design our own lit review, it's usually a pretty good idea to read other lit reviews to see what was done. Uh, so that way you don't waste, uh, like in my case, I'm writing one now. It's taken me about 14 months to do it thus far. I have about four more months to go. Uh, if I didn't look at what else was done as a lit review, then I would have, you know, if somebody else has already done what I'm doing, I would have wasted 18 months of my life. I would not have published a, a paper and I would have been in big trouble with the university because we, we have to publish. Um, so... This is all original. This here is secondary. We are doing overviews. So I, I had to read 30 to 40 papers and say, okay, these are an overview of what all these are about. Um, we are providing information about trends and themes and backgrounds. We are establishing well-known facts in a secondary one because we're getting those facts from here. You know, here, let, let me make this a little more interact, interactive for you all. We are establishing well-established facts that we are getting from primary resources. So uh, we know these are facts because primary resources have to undergo peer review and, and lots of scrutiny by other professors who are experts in the field. You cannot tell lies and get away with it and publish it. And this is less detail about many things, right? So this more details about a few things. In this, they're looking at mechanisms usually, especially in nutrition and in exercise physiology. Lots of details about cellular mechanisms where this is way less of a deep dive. We're not doing a big deep dive because again, it's an overview and I have some examples here. So these are studies that you have probably read before and maybe you didn't realize what type of studies they were. But some examples of primary studies would be a randomized control trial. Okay, well, what the heck is that? So I made an example, a study where participants are randomly assigned, and I put here a high protein diet because we have some nutrition, nutrition folks in here, or a standard diet to observe the effects on muscle mass and strength over 12 weeks. That's pretty specific. And randomize means we're not, we're not putting women on one side, men on the other. This says that we are randomly sending participants into a, either a high protein diet or a standard diet. And then we're gonna see what that does to muscle mass over time, right? So that would be a primary uh, research project. We could also have cohort studies. Well, what is that? Well, here's an example. If we're tracking a group of athletes over several years, that's usually co cohort studies are usually long periods of time. And we're seeing what the uh, effects of different training intensities are on cardiovascular health. So if we do some certain types of athletes, 
what might a cohort study do? Well, if we're doing long periods of time and we're seeing what long-term training effects with different intensities due to cardiovascular health, well, for you exercise scientists, you're probably saying, oh, they probably are following athletes who are going through preseason and season and postseason for several years. And if you've worked with athletes or if you've done anything with athletes, you realize that those three different types of periodization or those three different types of seasons have different intensities and have different goals. So usually preseason is very, very high intensity. We're trying to get athletes into shape. In season is generally maintenance, so you have to completely change your approach to how you're training these athletes. And postseason is generally recovery with some type of maintenance, which is a lower intensity. So if we did that for several years and followed the exact same athletes through all these different seasons, well, we're following the same athletes, we're looking at very specific things, and the same researchers are following these athletes. So that would be primary. And then we also have a cross-sectional study survey, right? Um, so this, an example of this would be conducting a survey to collect data on dietary habits and physical activities um, among college students to analyze correlation with body composition, right? So three very different types of study, but they're all primary research. Now on the opposite end of that, so again, this is very specific data that we're collecting. Results are observation in their original context. You know, maybe in this one, it's more cellular. Maybe in this one, it's more clinical. And maybe in this one, it's a bit more, core, we're using more correlations, right? Um, so we have different results and different observations, but we are discovering new findings, okay? And these generally have a lot of details in them, especially if you're doing things with proteomics and you're doing things with protein and, and uh, cellular metabolism or protein synthesis over protein degradation. Um, those are gonna have a lot more details in it. Let me erase all this so that when I send you these slides, you don't have my uh, chicken scratch all over it. Okay, and again, if we look at systematic reviews or oops, sorry about that secondary research these are all combining data a comprehensive review of existing studies a literature review discussing current trends and all of these let's get it again all of these cannot be created unless we have all of these okay so primary and secondary and again go back to it we're doing the own work, our own work, or we're taking somebody else's work and uh, making something new of it or enjoying it. Um, okay, so let's move on. So now we have basic versus applied research. Uh, what you see here in the uh, analogy is we have two bookshelves, right? But this is a very basic bookshelf that somebody put together uh, in their garage. They did quite a nice job. But when you go over here, uh, you see this type of bookshelf. And here you have a uh, very customized, very unique, very specific type of bookshelf, right? So when we start talking about basic research, this is fundamental research, okay? And it's, they also call it pure research. And this aims to expand knowledge and understanding of fundamental principles in science without any specific pra practical application. It's more exploratory, right? That's why it's basic. Where applied, we have an application. So this is basic. Somebody was, uh, you know, exploring their ability to write or to, to make a, a bookshelf. And over here, we have applied science. This, this, so, so what is applied science? Well, on the other hand, this is conducted to solve a very specific practical problem with real world answers or answers to real world questions. So it takes theories and knowledge gained from basic science, right? So it takes the basic structure and it expands on it, okay? Um, and I have some examples here, right? So you're like, okay, well, that, that those were, let me erase, whoops, let me, geez, let me erase this. Um, erase all ink, there we go. So I don't send you my chicken scratch. And uh, let me erase this. Okay, and let's go to the next section. So um, here are examples. So basic, sam basic science is basically asking why is this important? 
and applied science is how can I use this? All right. So I th thought this was a really uh, good way of saying it. So let's start with basic. I should have put basic on this side, but I didn't. So let's say we're looking at metabolic pathways in exercise. Basic science would be investigating how different types of exercise, aerobic versus anaerobic, affect cellular energy metabolism okay so it's basic it's exploratory and it's saying at a molecular level such as changes in mitochondria function now if we go to nutritional metabolism basic science is again exploring investigating right how various nutrients like carbohydrates proteins and fats are metabolized in the body during different states such as fasting versus fed or rest versus exercise or if we have another example, looking at hormones and regulation on appetite, um, a study, we're, if we're studying the role, right? So this is exploring, we don't know it yet, studying the role of hormones like leptin and ghrelin in regulating hunger and satiety and how exercise might alter these hormone signals. Now, if we go over to applied science, this is how do we take this information and use it? How do we apply it? What's its application? So if we talk about a nutritional intervention for weight loss, a study testing the effectiveness of a new diet plan, okay? We can't look at the effectiveness of something new unless it's already been discovered in the realm of basic science, okay? So over here, we were looking at just exploring how various nutrients like carbohydrates, proteins are metabolized during exercise. But on this side, we're looking at, okay, what about a low carb diet diet or a Mediterranean diet on weight loss and metabolic health in overweight individuals? So we're taking what we gained in basic science and applying it in this case to overweight individuals. We are applying low carb diets and Mediterranean diets. Well, how do we know what a low carb diet and a Mediterranean diet is? Well, because some years ago, basic sciences said, Hey, you know, we, we've been looking at this. We're going to identify it as um as a mediterranean diet and we're seeing that these mediterranean diets uh lots of blue zones throughout the world use the mediterranean diet and people are much healthier so um yeah so that's how that would work and if we're looking at an exercise program an example design and testing high intensity interval training okay hit programming to improve cardiovascular fitness in sedentary individuals so again applied science is how can i use this so I have a population here, which is sedentary adults, and I am going to apply this high intensity exercise to see if it improves cardiovascular health, not only cardiovascular health, but in this specific population. So I am using something as a, our keyword for applied sciences, our intervention, okay? So remember that word intervention. Intervention is what we use in applied sciences to see how something impacts a group of people. How can I use this? What is the, I'm not even gonna to try to write intervention because I'm using a mouse um, and I'm left-handed, but I'm using the mouse on my right hand. So I'm just gonna write I and T, well, that's that's not too bad. I, let's see, E, I'm writing very slow, inter, nope, I'm done. Intervention. All right. So intervention. What will this intervention, if I apply this intervention, what will it do to overweight individuals? What will it do to sedentary individuals? And if we're looking at sports nutrition, um, we're looking at how carbohydrate loading, and we're going to apply that to, uh, to marathon runners. And we're looking to aim, we're going to look into aiming to optimize nutritional strategies before competition. Okay, so I have a population, marathon runners. I'm looking to apply carbohydrate loading, right? Maybe we'll do 400 milligrams. Maybe we'll do, I'm sorry, 400 grams. Maybe we'll do 600 grams. They're marathon runners. So I'd probably do something like 800 grams. And I'm going to see what that application does before competition. All right, so there is an example of basic and applied, right? So somebody here took their basic knowledge of how to make a bookshelf and they applied it over here, they got really good at it, to make a customized bookshelf. We can't have this beautiful craftsmanship without having understood how to do it in the first place, okay? So that is the difference between those. And I hope these analogies 
are really helping you. Um, whoops, that's not what I wanted. We're going to zoom back out. I hope these things are really helping you al along the way. And just bear with me while I do all this editing in real time. And let me clean this up for you guys. There we go. Okay, so now let's look at qualitative versus quantitative research. And again, this we don't use very often in our world, okay? Quantitative is what we use. So what is the difference between, between qualitative and quantitative? So let's say I bought all of you a ticket to travel somewhere in the world. And you have two ways to figure out how that culture works. We, I, we can either drop ourselves into the city we can walk the streets, we can count buildings, we can count cabs, we can count lights, we can count crosswalks, we can count streets, and then we can come back home and we can make a report saying, I walked this many blocks, I came across this many buildings, I saw this many streets, I um, ate at this many restaurants, and what you start to do is you start to build these these bar graphs, right? That's how many streets they had. Or yeah, that's how many streets they had. This is how many restaurants they had. Uh, when we look at Mexican restaurants compared to Italian restaurants, Mexican restaurants were like this. Italian restaurants were like this, right? So we start to design, and you guys should be very familiar with these bar graphs, right? X and Y axes. X, X and Y, right? Usually we have a variable and time or something like that. Well, that's quantitative research. We went in, we did the research ourselves, we collected the data, we came back and analyzed the data. We could present the data using um, statistics and numbers and charts and graphs. Um, and we can say, okay, well, based upon all of this information that I collected personally, oops, sorry about that go back. Um, I quantified, right? That sounds very close to quantitative. I quantified this whole experience. Now, qualitative would be, okay, if this is the same person, this person is not going to go anywhere. This person is going to talk to the locals to get the information about where he is visiting, right? Two very different approaches. This qualitative is more of a narrative. Well, I spoke to the locals and this is what they told me about the city. Where quantitative is, well, I went to the city and I collected all this data, right? So it's, it's very different types of research methodology. This one, uh, you know, I'm not being biased. I'm not knocking any other types of uh, sciences out there. But when we get into the medical sciences and the applied health sciences, uh, it's very rigorous okay it's very time consuming we have very different standards that we have to abide by versus qualitative research which is more of a quality of an experience like right? quality qualitative where quantitative is i have to quantify the experience in some sort of way that i can present okay so i hope that makes sense and we will move on now to um, talking about, let me click this and that should animate, uh, an overview of important topics that we have to start getting to uh, be comfortable with. So I'm going to show you guys a picture next. By no means do you have to memorize this. And you probably will recognize most of this picture because I just went through it with you and we can beat a dead horse and kind of talk about it in a little more detail. Okay, so you should see some things that we... Uh, talked about previously. Uh, we're talking about some topics in research. You see that research studies, we have two main classifications, right? We have primary studies. Gave you the analogy about going to a city and collecting all the data yourself. I gave you some examples. If you need those examples, here they are, of some different types. Um, and we talked about secondary, right? So secondary is here. And we said that that's uh, using other resources such as primary research, research to tell a story about a broader topic, right? This is very specific, uh, very complex and uh, a deep dive into a specific um, mechanism per se. And this is a broader overview about a lot of papers that discuss 
this specific mechanism. And, and again, if you need examples, here are some examples. And here is this information here, right? So you have plenty of opportunities. I put together lots of information for you um, so you can become more comfortable with this. Now, when we talk about primary studies, we know we have either a quantitative approach or we have a qualitative approach. You're like, oh, okay, I remember he said that. Um, so we, we go back to this, right? This was our quantitative. This person is walking the streets, counting, collecting data, making bar graphs, making tables, making figures that represent uh, what she had experienced. And then we also have the qualitative, right? And the qualitative is more of a narrative, right? And we don't use much of that in our in our world. So if we look at quantitative, we're not going to really care about quantitative because we're not going to do we're not going to do much with this. Uh, there are some biomedical labs that will do a combination of quantitative and qualitative. Some pharmacology um, labs do it we uh it's rare okay um and when we go into secondary studies we can do a meta-analysis a systematic review or a narrative review and you're scratching your head saying okay where where have i heard that before well it's right here systematic review meta-analysis narrative review right lots of overlapping here just making sure that we we're getting it so we're gonna let's just uh for the sake of keeping things as simple as i can and i like using this pen we're just gonna cross this out we don't care right this is what we care about and this is going to tell our story for this okay so when we have a quantitative study we can further divide that and i'm not going to get too far into this because we're going to cover this over their semester. We could have experimental and we can have observational. Well, experimental is kind of more of what we do in the nutritional and exercise sciences. Um, observational, we don't do as much unless you're doing these long cohort studies, right? Which we talked about or cross-sectional studies, right? So these are words you should be familiar with. And if you're not familiar with that, all you got to do is go back over here, cohort studies, cross-sectional studies, randomized control studies, right? So we go back here, randomized control studies. So these are all examples of quantitative research, and that's what we are going to focus on throughout the duration of this course, uh, because that's uh, what seems to tell the best story for the mechanisms that we look at when we conduct research. Um, okay. So let's look at the next slide. And this one here is talking about specifically qualitative versus quantitative research. So I, I want to put this on here just because people forget it. I know that when I went through these courses, I would always get the two confused. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do is make sure that you are not confused. Um, so I have this picture here, and this kind of helps me think about it a little better. When we talk about qualitative versus quantitative to me quantitative is a bit more rigid it's a bit more rigor where qualitative is a bit more flexible right and if we look back at this this kind of tells that story if you have to go street to street and collect that information and collect that data and try to get as much information as you can um well that is in this case, this would be an observational study, right? Because we're observing. But this is very rigid. This is the high rigor, right? Where if you just go talk to the locals and you come up with a narrative based upon these secondary sources, that's a bit more flexible in the research approach. Now, if this rigid versus flexibility story doesn't uh, really speak to you, well, then I have this one here. And I think of siblings, right? If we have in medical science, if we have quantitative research, um, that is like a sibling that is very serious, very stern, very introverted, right? But if we have qualitative research, we have kind of the free spirit. Uh, if any of you have any, um, if you are the third sibling or you have 
uh, two other siblings and you have a third child in the family, you know that the third one is generally the goofball and is generally uh, the free spirit. My youngest, who is five, I don't even think, I don't even know if he's mine. He is so different than the other two and so goofy. Um, so yeah, so we have uh, rigidity versus flexibility, or we have more stern and serious research versus uh, a little more open-ended, a little more um, freedom in the research, okay? So just giving you guys some different anal analyses to look at. And if that doesn't work, well, then let's look at this one here. I have some quick and dirty definitions, right? So if you can't, you're just like, man, it's not making sense to me, which for some of you, you, you may not have done research before. It might not be making sense. Quantitative research deals with quantities, right? Data that deals with quantities. And that's why when I brought up this lecture and I told you what this person was doing, she was walking around taking observations and trying to quantify what she saw. And as a result of those quantifications, she created bar graphs to demonstrate what those quantifications were. And she might have even done statistics to show you if the difference between this and this were in fact significant. Uh, that is quantitative research. It is being based upon quantity. Okay. Now, qualitative research is based around these qualities, right? Qualitative research is, again, we are, we are looking at qualities. So this person is saying, okay, what is it like to live here? What is the quality of life? Where this person is directly observing those things and trying to make, um, trying to make a discussion or figure out if her hypotheses is right based upon what she is directly observing. Okay. Um, so these are just kind of ways to, ways to kind of help you remember it. Um, and on this next slide here, I have one more example just to make sure that we understand what we're talking about. So what is the difference between qualitative and quantitative? Well, here's an image, right? Qualitative might be more narrative and quantitative is more hard evidence. And you can see here that if you were given a multiple choice question and it shows that 80 people choice, chose option A over chop, option B, that is quantitative, right? We know that this many people chose this over this. We could take that and we could turn it into a bar graph, right? We could say that if there were 100 people, it was significant that 80 of them chose, what did they say? A over B, right? That was a significant difference. Now, if the questionnaire tells you that Carrie from Connecticut felt option A made her feel more relaxed and that she thought it was more attractive, more of an attractive color than option B, you're looking at qualitative research. Do you see the difference? This one is more rigid. This one is more flexible. This is your, uh, let's say it's your first child, right? The introvert. This is the third child, the free spirit. Okay. And then there is one more um, thing here that you can look at. I've given you plenty of examples. There's no reason you should not uh, understand this at this point. And I just put this here as well, just to beat a dead horse. And you can look at that one. Now let's look at some of the focuses of qualitative and quali I'm sorry, qualitative and quantitative research. I'm getting tongue tied here. Qualitative research explores a meaning. Okay. Well, this means this. Let's talk about what that means. Where quantitative reading re research is just an objective measurement. We're not going to talk about what we think this means. We're going to make an observation. We're going to mem we're going to measure it. We're going to use statistics to figure out what it's doing. And then in the discussion, we are going to talk about what we hypothesize this might mean. Okay. Um, this can be qualitative is thematic analysis where quantitative is statistical analysis. And again, we're not going to do this, but it's in the textbook. It's part of the objectives that they want taught. So by golly, we are going to teach it. This generally deals with smaller sample sizes. This generally deals with larger sample sizes. Now, unless you are doing human research, um, quantitative research can be very small. So for example, um, I do human research. I've always done human research. And when we go in and we get muscle biopsies 
or we do a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp and we give our individuals glucose and we give them insulin and we track those things in the body over the course of two hours, well, that is a very invasive and intense study. So if we get an N of 10, that's not a big set, right? That's, that's a really low number, but we're doing human translational research and we can use that type of small end size to make a very big impact in what we're trying to what we're trying to say. So uh, it doesn't always have to be large data sets. But if you're doing, let's say you're doing nutritional, um, let's say you're doing nutritional. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, questionnaires, right? You get more power with your statistics if you have 100 people versus 50 people. If you have 200 people versus 100 people, right? The more and the more sample size you have, the greater power you have with your statistics and the greater greater quantifications you can do, right? Um, these are generally open-ended inquiries and these are hypothesis testing, right? So again, all we're focusing on is this with primary research where we're going to use quantitative studies, right? We have very structured methods, right? We can't just go in and do whatever we want. We focus on relationships and it's very standardized. Okay. Um, let's move to the next section. Let me clean this up before I send you guys to the next section. Where is my, uh oh, where is, there it is. Okay. Got it. Erase all marks. Okay. Now, the reasoning in quantitative research is deductive and qualitative is inductive. You don't need to know this, this we need to know, right? So deductive reasoning is like a puzzle. You start with a big general idea. What do we call that? It's a hypothesis, okay? My hypothesis is this, and we use it to solve smaller specific problems, right? We hypothesize that uh, free radical generation in skeletal muscle is coming from a specific enzyme, but we don't know which one. We know that it comes from the mitochondria, that's very general, but we also know that there are these enzymes called NOx2 and NOx3 and NOx4, which produce free radicals, but we don't know how much, we don't know where they're located in skeletal muscle, but we do know they're there because somebody looked at it in rodents and they found it. And usually whatever is in rodent muscle, is in human muscle. So we know that they are, oops, sorry about that. Let me go back to this. We know that they are there. So we're gonna start with this general idea, right? We know that they're there. We know the mitochondria makes it, but we also are going to try to find if there's any of these enzymes in the muscle that make it. So then we're going to solve this smaller specific problem. We are looking for NOx2, and four, remember guys, I'm left-handed, but I'm using my right hand. We are looking for NOx2 and four in skeletal muscle, okay? Um, and we're going to see if it's there. So then we have to use our, our standardized research methodology. We have to get a population. We have to control the environment. We have to conduct our, our, our methods, right? We have to do the muscle biopsy, and then we have to analyze it and we say, oh, we found that yes, free radicals are made in muscle, but when we looked into human muscle, we found that there's these enzymes here that produce it as well, right? Um, and here's just another example. You guys could read that, but deductive reason, reasoning is very general to very specific. So in our type of research, you are going to make a dovetail. You are gonna start very broad and you are gonna go down very specific to a single point. And likewise, the paragraphs that we write in our literature review are also going to act this way. We are going to start with a broad topic and then start to narrow it down. So when you guys think about this deductive reasoning, it starts wide, it gets small, it's a dovetail. Okay. So there's just another kind of reasoning, uh, what we use in our type of research in quantitative research. Uh, and then here is just uh, a picture to help you with that because I like giving you guys pictures just because it just helps keep things in the memory. So in deductive reasoning, I start with a theory. I confirm a hypothesis. I tend to do quantitative research. We're going to give her a check. Good job. In inductive reasoning that we would use in qualitative research, I start with data. 
I infer conclusions from my data. I tend to do qualitative research, right? So very different. Let's move on. Now, the setting between these two types of studies are also very different. When we do qualitative research, it's generally in the natural setting. Okay, the researcher takes a place in part takes place in the participants' natural environments, providing a more authentic context, right? Uh, so who would do something like this? Well, I love one of my favorite animals are uh, I'm drawing with my right hand, the octopus, right? So I hope none of you eat calamari or octopus. And this is a this is a very happy octopus. He's just glad to be here. Um, if I were to jump into the ocean and I just wanted to qualify what a octopus does throughout a day, I would jump into its natural environment and I would just observe it. And I would take data and say, this is what I think. Now, if I wanted to do the same thing with Mr. Octopus over here, um, this is highly controlled. So it's got to be within a controlled environment. So let's say I wanted to look at how an octopus digests food. Well, I would have to capture an octopus and bring him back to the lab or her or it. I don't know how, I don't know how those, the, that all works with octopi. Um, and in the lab, I would have to control its diet. I would have to provide it with food and I would have to keep track of that food. So I know where the octopus stopped eating food in the ocean and when it started eating food in my lab. And then after a certain amount of time where I controlled its diet and I watched what it was doing, well, then I would have to uh, kill Mr. Octopus. I would have to cut open the octopi or octopus, and I would have to look and see how it is digesting food. I would look and see what was partially digested, what was fully digested. I might look at the intestinal tract to see how the food it took into its body got into its bloodstream, right? So very, very different types of settings that we use with qualitative and quantitative research. Um, and then lastly, the other one is data analysis. So in qualitative research, again, it's mostly narrative, right? I jumped into the water. This is what I saw with the octopi. Uh, it had lunch with its uh, counterpart. They they had some um, they had some shrimp that was on the bottom of the sea floor. They then went for a stroll together, uh, holding tentacles side by side. Uh, it, they watched the sunset. It was a very uh, romantic experience between the octopi. Right? I'm telling you, I'm narrating what I saw. Now, when I well. Uh, took the octopi back to my octopus back to the lab and I killed it. I would say this is how many days I fed it. This was the volume of food that I fed. I weighed it. I weighed to see how much weight it gained or lost while it was in the lab. Um, you know, maybe it was just eating less food because it was in captivity. And then I measured um, it's nutrient uptake in the octopus's small intestines. I don't think they have small intestines, but you get what I'm saying, right? This is narrative. This is, hey, I completely deconstructed this thing and I measured it and I weighed it and I used statistics to show you um, what it does, okay? So that is the major difference between the qualitative and quantitative. And again, it's important because those two are both primary research, but we are going this path. Okay, um, so now let's move on to, uh, we're almost done here, the hierarchy of evidence-based practice. Okay, so we're talking about evidence-based research, right? And there is a hierarchy to this process. And if we look at this here, we have observational studies, we have experimental studies, and then we have critical appraisals, right? So, um, when we look at meta-analysis, systematic reviews, and these different sort of um, secondary research methods, these are not very strong compared to these types of primary research, right? And we're going by with here, right? We're looking at um, we're looking at case studies or cohort studies or non-randomized or randomized control, right? These are the different types of primary research. Sorry about that. 
Sorry about that. These are the different types of primary research that is used in utilizing quantitative methodology, right? So these are very, very strong. These has a, they have a lot of impact. These don't have as much impact and they're not as rigorous to create, which is why we are going to do a review paper in our class because we don't have a lot of time and we got to learn how to do this before we learn how to do these down here, right? So just kind of showing you the, the weakness or the impact factor of these different types of studies. So now the last section we're going to talk about is variables. So now when we're talking about research, we have to talk about our variables. And this is something that a lot of people get very confused about when it comes to dependent and independent variables. It's very tricky. So we got to understand the relationship between variables. Um, and we have independent variables, we have dependent variables, and then we have confounding variables. So let's, let's talk about these for just a moment. And of course, we'll spend more time um, we'll spend more time on this as we get further into the class. Um, so what is an independent variable? So an independent variable is the factor that you change or you manipulate to see if it causes an effect, right? So this is something we manipulate or we control, all right? And I'll give you some examples of this. And we want to see what sort of effect it has. So the dependent variable is the outcome that you measure. So this is dependent on this. So in this case, let's say you have high blood pressure. And in research, I give you blood pressure medication. Well, that blood pressure medication is an exogenous agent that is going to help regulate your blood pressure. Therefore, I am manipulating or I am controlling your physiology by giving you this blood pressure medication. That is the independent variable, okay? Or remember what I told you guys earlier, the intervention, this is what I am introducing new to your life. I am intervening with your physiology with this. And now the dependent variable is I'm gonna see how this impacts your blood pressure, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna measure and observe how this, the independent variable, is impacting this, okay? Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, let's say I sit somebody down in front of me and I just slap them across the face, okay? Let's just, you hear a, right? That slap is the independent variable. I am manipulating the environment. I am controlling the environment. I'm going from a very calm demeanor to a, uh, I can do either a forehand or a backhand, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then the dependent variable is going to be the person's response. Does their cheek get red? Do they begin to develop a tear in their eye? Do they say, ouch, that hurts, right? So the response, or the what I measure as the response, is dependent upon the independent variable, okay? And then we have this thing called a confounding variable. And this is, there. so there's many other variables with confounding or unwanted influences on the dependent variable. So what does that mean? Well, let's say, let's go back to the medication. Let's say I give you this medication and it is having this wonderful effect on your blood pressure, but you are eating lots of salt. Well, what is lots of salt going to do? Well, it's going to increase water retention. It's going to increase uh, blood um, serum or blood plasma. plasma. Uh, it's going to cause greater preloading in the heart because you have more retention of water, right? You're going to have greater um, ex expan uh, expanding of the atriums and the ventricles. You're going to have greater ejection fraction, um, which means that all that pressure is now going to go back up because of this confounding variable. Okay, let's say, um, let's go back to that slapping uh, scenario, okay? Uh, the independent variable is, is my hand across the individual's cheek, right? I slap them, and then the dependent variable is how does their skin respond? How, do the, how does their emotions respond? How does, do they tear up? Do they, do they cry? Do they say, ouch? Um, but let's say the confounding factor 
is uh, before we did this slap, they were at the dentist getting a root canal, and I didn't know that. And at the dentist, they gave them Novocaine, and the whole right side of their cheek is completely numb, so the slap had no impact on them. So what I measured is not a true response because they were at the dentist and they uh, they had the uh, Novocaine, and uh, that would be a confounding factor or a confounding variable. Okay, so now uh, let's imagine, let me give you one more example here. Let's say we are, let me give you an analogy to this now. Let's say we are drinking coffee, all right? So imagine you want to determine if coffee, that would be the independent variable, improves alertness, right? Because the coffee is what I'm introducing. I don't know how somebody is alert at baseline, right? We would take some sort of measurement at baseline to say, okay, this is their alertness level. And now I'm going to give them this independent variable, which is coffee. And what I want to measure is, does this improve alertness? So if this improves it, that's the dependent variable because I'm taking the baseline variable, which is their baseline level of alertness, and I'm seeing if coffee increases that or decreases that. So let's say we notice that people who drink coffee in the morning tend to be more alert. However, there's another factor at play. Let's say many of these coffee drinkers also get a good night's sleep. Uh, so what would a good night's sleep do? Well, that could be the confounding variable, right? We don't know if someone who's drinking lots of coffee is alert because of the coffee or maybe they're alert because they're having 12 hours of sleep a day. We, we don't know that. So sleep can be a confounding factor. We, we have to know that. So in this case, coffee or drinking coffee, okay, this is coffee. That would be the independent IV, independent variable, okay? We want to see what impact this has on alertness, right? He doesn't look like the coffee's doing very good. Those eyes look very tired. But we also need to keep in mind that this individual might only be sleeping two hours a night. So if they're sleeping two hours a night, that's like me, that's my life. If they're only sleeping two hours a night, we can assume that coffee is going to be very impactful, right? So the independent variable will be very impactive on the dependent variable, his alertness, because he's only sleeping two hours a night. But we could also flip that. We could say that this individual is drinking coffee. They're very alert, but maybe they're alert because now he's sleeping 10 hours a night, right? So that confounding factor or that confounding variable is very important. And as scientists, we have to understand, is it the impact? Is it if we see a change in something, is it the independent variable impacting the dependent variable? Or is the independent variable not doing much because there's a confounding factor or a confounding variable that is doing uh, changing this person's alertness? So I, I know it's it's sounds convoluted, but I'm just trying to introduce these things to you. So I am going to stop there. That's all I have for you. I am going to upload the ethics one now. I think we've covered a lot of ground here. And I think you have a pretty good understanding, especially between qualitative and quantitative research. Um, like I said, that stuff confused me for a long time. So I just want to make sure that you are uh, ready to rock and roll with that. And I will be back shortly with your ethics video. Take care.